By 1993, Ludmila Korovina, who was a 41-year-old Russian hiking instructor, came under fairly intense criticism from her colleagues for being too survivalist with her students. They thought she was a little bit too aggressive with how she pushed her students, putting them in unnecessarily risky situations out in the wild where they weren't really ready for it, and at any point, she might push them too far and wind up getting someone killed. Her students, however, absolutely adored her. They said on the mountains, she was fearless and in tune with nature, and they felt very safe around her. And then at camp, she was very motherly and tender and always took the time to make sure all of her students were taken care of well before she was. Former students have said the mentorship they received from Ludmila went well beyond just hiking instruction. They said she taught a mindset that they carried with them into adulthood and they pointed to as one of the main reasons they were successful later in life. In the summer of 1993, Ludmila was scheduled to lead an expedition up to the Hamar Daban Ridge, which is in eastern Siberia and it's one of the oldest mountains on the planet. With her on this expedition would be six fairly experienced hiking students that ranged in ages from 15 to 24 years old. One of those six students was a 23-year-old young man named Sasha, who, although he was not Ludmila's biological son, she called him her son because she had raised him ever since he was a young child, and he looked at Ludmila as his mother. Sasha also happened to be the most physically fit and competent of all six hiking students, and he would function more like an assistant to Ludmila on this particular hike rather than a pupil. The other five students were 24-year-old Tatiana, 19-year-old Dennis, 16-year-old Victoria, 15-year-old Timur, and 17-year-old Valentina, who she is the only reason we know anything about the horrible things that happened to this group up on Hamar Devon Ridge. On August 1st, 1993, Ludmila and her hiking group boarded a Trans-Siberian railway car in Kazakhstan, and later that day, they arrived in a town called Marino, which is on the eastern side of Siberia on the southern end, and it butts up against the base of the Hamar Daban mountain range. The Hamar Daban mountain was not considered a very dangerous hike to make. It was relatively small. It was just under 2,400 meters in elevation, and in the summertime, you'd have scores of recreational hikers all over this mountain range. Plus, the weather forecast for Ludmila and her group's multi-day hike in that mountain range was going to be incredibly favorable. It was going to be warm, clear, nice summer weather. Ludmila had charted a course that began just outside of the town of Marino, which is the town they were staying in that first night. They were going to start next to Lake Baikal, which is the deepest lake in Russia. From the lake, they were going to move north and inland over the stretch that was totally barren. There was no trees, it was just rocks and grass, before ultimately reaching the Hamar Daban Ridge, which was their destination. And at that point, there would be shelter and firewood, and they could take a break before ultimately descending. And so in total, from the lake all the way to Hamar Daban Ridge was approximately 50 miles. Ludmila's group would not be the only group making this particular movement towards Hamar Daban Ridge. They'd be taking their own path, but there'd be two other groups that were on similar courses, basically parallel to them, making their way up to the ridge. And one of those groups was actually led by Ludmila's 16-year-old biological daughter, and they had actually made plans to meet up on one of the last days of this multi-day hike. As they were making their descent, there was a forest they were going to meet up in. So Ludmila and her six students stayed the night in Marino, and the next morning they got up early and made their way over to Lake Baikal. The weather's beautiful, they're excited to start their journey, and they take off. And everything was going great until the late afternoon. It would turn out the weather forecasters were just completely wrong, and as soon as the group climbed above the tree line, the temperatures plummeted and it started raining and snowing on them. It was just absolutely miserable. This treacherous weather would persist over the next few days, and it really started to destroy the morale in the group. But Ludmila, she was a pro, and she had hiked in far worse conditions than this, and so she made a point of telling the group that this stuff happens. Bad weather happens. We are prepared. We are trained. We're going to be fine. You need to have a positive attitude about this. We need to just keep pushing forward and not play a victim here. And that was enough to inspire the group to just keep on going. You know, they believed in Ludmila, and she's telling them to keep going, so they kept going. By the evening of August 4th, so this is three full days of hiking later, they were only about 30 minutes away from the summit. They have now reached the point where they are in the open section of the mountain, where there is no reprieve from the wind or the rain or the snow. There's no trees to block anything. And so it's just an absolute abomination trying to climb this last stretch. Every step is like an eternity as the wind just cuts through their clothes and they're soaking wet and miserable. 
Ludmila's students were not about to ask for a break. They knew how she operated. She was someone that really believed in pushing through your own pain and fatigue and misery. And she always led by example. And they saw her, you know, right out in front, leading the charge up towards the Hamar Daban Ridge. And so they were very surprised when she stopped and she turned around and told them, we're taking a break. And in fact, we're actually gonna camp out for the night right where we are right here. No one knows why Ludmila made this decision. You know, on the one hand, it does make sense to take a break and say, you know what, we'll reach the summit tomorrow. We've had a really hard couple of days here with the bad weather. We'll make camp and we'll get some rest and we'll, we'll hit the summit tomorrow. That makes sense. But where she elected to make camp does not make sense. She had them stop right smack dab in the middle of this totally open section of the mountain where there are no trees, there's no objects to protect them from the horrible wind and snow and ice and rain that's just gonna be pelting them all night. And so some people have speculated that when she looked at her crew of hikers, they were so badly beaten down and tired and miserable that she knew she could not ask them to go any further. And so that was why she said, let's just make camp here, we'll make do. Others have said her map may not have been very accurate. And so she didn't know how close she was to the summit, where at the summit, there was literally a shelter that had firewood and a place for you to rest. Maybe she didn't know she was so close. Perhaps she thought she was much farther away and this is the best we can do. But what the inaccurate map theory does not account for is Ludmila would have known there is a forest about two and a half miles down the mountain because the whole time they've been on this hike, they've tried to stay up above the tree line as they make this final approach up to the ridge. And so she would have known there's a forest right down there. And if I wanted to, I could go down there and seek shelter in the trees. And so for whatever reason, she decided that we can't go down to the forest, we gotta stay here. And so perhaps that lends more credibility to the idea that the group was far more beaten down than maybe we even realize. And she thought they can't make the two and a half mile journey. We're gonna have to just make camp here and make do. But regardless of her reasoning, they did make camp right in the middle of this open section. They set up two wet, crappy tents and they used their little kerosene stoves to make a tiny meal. And then they all crammed inside of these two tents and huddled as the wind howled outside. That night, the storm got much worse. The wind picked up and again, they're totally exposed on this open section of the mountain. And so they're just getting destroyed by this wind. And at about 2 a.m., the wind actually broke the ropes that were holding the tents down and they had to go outside and retie them. And they were able to do that. And then a couple hours later at about 4 a.m., the wind actually lifted up the section of the tent that was facing where the wind was blowing. And it pulled the tent up in such a way that water rushed into the tent and soaked their sleeping bags. And they were able to go outside and they put the stakes back down on the ground, but you know, they were sleeping in wet sleeping bags in the middle of this mountain in the middle of a storm. So this is getting quite dangerous at this point. But they were able to eventually fall asleep. And at about 10 a.m. the next morning, Ludmila gets up and looks outside and she can see that everything is frozen, that it's snowed and the temperatures have dropped again and everything is just snow and ice. And she knows that, you know, we're actually reaching very dangerous hypothermia territory. And if we don't warm up soon, this could be life-threatening. And so she woke everybody up and she said, we need to go down into that forest and we need to start a fire as soon as possible. And so everybody said, all right, they got up, they started packing up their things, rolled up their tents, and they began walking down the mountain in a line. Although this was not intended, when Ludmila had said, we will reach the summit tomorrow, that had delayed their schedule. And it meant they were not gonna be able to meet up with her daughter the next day. But now in the morning, when they're deciding basically to abandon the summit and turn around and head down again, they were now back on schedule to meet up with her daughter down in the forest. However, her daughter said she was at the rendezvous point in the forest and Ludmila and the six other hikers never showed. Four days later on August 9th, a group of Ukrainian kayakers were making their way down this river in Southern Siberia and they were passing by the Hamar Devan mountain range. And so as they're kind of slowly moving their way down, it's this beautiful morning and they're looking up at the mountains all around them. The leader of this group happens to see something move on his left side. There's a forest right up against the left side of this river and he turns his head and he has to do a double take because there is this girl who's standing there at the edge of the forest, looking out at them totally expressionless and she's covered in blood and she's not doing anything. She's just standing there. And at first he actually thought like, we need to leave. His first thought was we need to just get away from this person. There's something Something wrong with this person but very quickly the group realized like we, we cannot abandon this girl this is a young girl who should not be out here I don't know what she's doing out here and so they turned around and they went on shore and, and they yelled to her they said are, are you okay 
and she just stood there not reacting and they tried a couple more times to say you know hey we're, we're not going to hurt you we just want to know what's going on and she didn't say a word she just stood there in shock she looked very scared they finally got up right next to her and they, they asked her you know what are you what are you so scared of where are you coming from and they just could not get her to speak but they're up close looking at her and you know she's got blood all over her she looks dirty she looks like she might be sick and so they decide that you know this girl needs help and they had blankets and so they threw blankets over her they put her in one of the kayaks and they brought her back to town once in town the ukrainian kayakers went and got authorities and said hey we found this girl you know she's covered in blood walking out of the forest we have no idea what's going on with her and so authorities came over to speak to her and although she barely spoke she would finally say that she was 17 years old her name was valentina yotachenko and that she had been a part of a seven person hiking group up along the hamar Daban ridge and then she paused and they said well where's your hiking group how did you get separated this is what she told them back on the morning of august 5th so this would have been the morning after that terrible night sleep on the mountain where the tent ropes are breaking and their sleeping bags are getting soaking wet well, Valentina wakes up and she looks outside of the tent and she sees Ludmila and she's standing there with her hands on her hips and she's looking around. She looks very concerned. Valentina goes out there and Ludmila turns to her and says, we need to leave. We need to go down to the forest and we need to make a fire. Can you help me wake everybody up and start having them pack up their stuff so we can get moving? And so Valentina goes in, she starts waking people up and everybody very quickly packs up the tent, packs up their things and they're in a line and they start walking down the mountain. They had only made it about 10 meters into their descent when Sasha, the 23-year-old young man that Ludmila considered her son, he just suddenly falls. And the other hikers, Valentina included, run over and they, they help get him up again and he looks kind of shaken. He takes a couple more steps and he falls again. And this time when Valentina goes over to try to help him up with the others, they see his eyes are wide and he looks like he's really terrified and then blood starts rushing out of his nose and his ears and his mouth and then he just suddenly dies. And Ludmila runs over and she grabs him and she's panicking and she's trying to feel for a pulse and she's checking for his heart. And then she screams out in pain and anguish and she yells, he's dead. The other hikers can't believe this is happening. They can't even process that someone, any of them had died, let alone it be Sasha, the most physically fit and healthy one of all of them, including up until a few minutes ago. He wasn't showing any signs or symptoms that something was wrong. He was perfectly fine. What's going on? Ludmila was in shock. She's on the ground and she's holding on to Sasha and she's telling the group that she's not going anywhere. She's staying with Sasha. And Valentina would say the group is just falling apart at this point. You have some of them that are crying, others who are just standing there looking around like what's happening to us right now. And at some point Ludmila collects herself and she says to the group, go down to the forest. Go down to the forest and start a fire. And Valentina said they didn't want to leave her and they were pleading with her to let them stay. And she said, no, go down to the forest and start a fire. And finally, Valentina said the group would. They'd get together and they'd turn around and not really knowing what was going to happen next, they just begin walking down this mountain and they only get a few steps before they hear Ludmila yell out to come back. She's saying, I can't move. And they turn around and Valentina was towards the front of the returning group as they're going back up the mountain, back to Ludmila. And she's now bleeding out of her nose and her ears and her mouth. She's heaving like something's going on inside of her. And then all of a sudden she keels over on top of Sasha. And she dies right in front of them. And now, now the group is in hysterics. And Valentina's in the front. She can't see anybody else. And then she turns around and she can't believe what she's seeing to her side. Now everybody else is bleeding from their nose and their ears and their mouth. And some of them are frothing from the mouth. Valentina reached for her mouth and her ears and her nose to look for blood and there wasn't any. And then she turned and she saw 16-year-old Victoria and 24-year-old Tatiana suddenly fall to the ground, just like Sasha had, except they weren't just laying there. They began rolling around and ripping their clothes off and clutching at their throats and they're frothing at the mouth. And so Valentina reaches down to try to help Victoria, the 16-year-old, and Victoria bites her on the hand and she pulls her hand back. And then Victoria curls into a ball and then goes still. And then Tatiana begins hitting her head on a rock over and over and over again until she goes still. At this point, Valentina is in pure survival mode. And so she looks at the other two, which was 15-year-old Timmer and 19-year-old Dennis. Everybody else is, is down on the ground at this point. 
and she sees Dennis is moving behind a rock and he looks like he's not acting as erratic as everybody else. And so she starts making her way over to Dennis to see if he's gonna be okay. And on the way, she sees 15 year old Timmer fall to the ground and he's suddenly lying there still. And so she believes he's dead too. She gets over to Dennis and he's bleeding profusely from all of his orifices in his head, but he's talking to her and he's saying, okay, you need to go back to your bag, get out whatever you can that is essential, ditch the rest and run down to the forest and I'll meet you down there. And so Valentina says, okay, she makes her way up to her bag. She gets her sleeping bag and a couple other small items. And when she turns around to go back to Dennis, she sees that he's now slouched over his backpack and now the blood is just pouring out of his head. And she can tell that almost certainly he's dead as well. And so not only is she all alone, she's now totally traumatized and believes whatever has happened to them is gonna happen to her. And so she runs down the mountain and she goes into the forest and she gets underneath this rock overhang. She puts her sleeping bag down, she crawls inside and she drifts in and out of consciousness for the rest of the day. And then that night, she's still laying there and the storm picked up dramatically and she could hear all night these huge trees all over the mountain falling and slamming all around her. And so she's thinking, if I don't die from whatever killed my friends, I'm gonna get hit by one of these trees but she manages to get through the night. The next morning, the storm had cleared, and so Valentina gets up and she's thinking to herself, maybe by some miracle, one of them is still alive. And so she climbs back up the mountain to where they were, and she finds all of them still laying exactly where they were when she left them, all motionless, all deceased. And so she decides to go one by one and close each of their eyelids. And then she says her goodbye. And then she turns and kind of wanders back into the forest where she would stay for the next four days, desperately walking around, hoping to be rescued at some point the whole time, just expecting to die either from exposure, from an animal attack, from whatever killed my friends. Eventually she does hear voices and she starts making her way towards where they're coming from. And that's when she gets to the river and she sees the Ukrainian kayakers who ultimately pick her up and bring her back to town. After authorities heard Valentina's story and realized there were other hikers out there, they launched a search party and it would take them a month to locate them. Their bodies were contorted and their faces were locked in these, these grimaces that looked like they were in absolute terror and agony right as they died. In addition to missing most of their clothing and their shoes, they were also all missing their eyeballs. The autopsies were only able to conclude that hypothermia contributed to their death, although it wasn't the only factor, as well as a protein deficiency, despite the fact that they had all eaten well over the course of their trip, and that all of their lungs were very bruised, but they didn't know what that was from. But nothing the autopsy concluded could reconcile what Valentina said she saw happen, which was a sudden, violent death of six healthy people with no signs and symptoms leading up, suddenly they are bleeding out of every orifice and they're falling to the ground, tearing their clothes off, grabbing at their throats, frothing at the mouth, and then dying. And whatever happened to them, why didn't it happen to Valentina? To this day, we don't really have a good answer why that happened, and the case is closed. It was ruled they mostly died of hypothermia and it was an accident, and that's that. But this isn't the first time something like this has happened in Russia. In 1959, nine very experienced Russian hikers set off on a 16-day expedition into the Ural Mountains in the Soviet Union, and about 10 days into their hike, they reached a part where they needed to crest over this mountain before some bad weather rolled in, and they started moving up this mountain, which would be renamed the Dyatlov Pass after the leader of this group, his name is Dyatlov. They started making their way up the Dyatlov Pass, and they were going too slowly, and the weather was coming in too quickly. And so they had to make a critical decision. Stay put, but be in this totally exposed open mountain face, much like the Hamar Daban situation where they were up on that open mountain face, either hunker down there and get ruined by weather. And the weather was a lot worse for the Dyatlov Pass group. It was, you know, sub-zero temperatures and just snowing ruthlessly. Or they could go down and give up ground and go down to the forest at the base of this mountain where you'd be sheltered from the storm with some trees. And so these hikers who might be a little bit overconfident in their ability decide to stick it out right on this mountain face. And over the course of that night, at some point, they cut open their tent with a knife from the inside and ran out into sub-zero temperatures, most of them not wearing shoes, not wearing jackets, not wearing pants. They're basically in underwear. And they calmly walked down the mountain all the way down to the forest 
And once they got down there, two of them tried to desperately climb this big tree where there wasn't any low hanging branches. And so they couldn't climb up it. We don't know what they were trying to climb up it for, but they ended up building this little tiny fire that could not have provided very much warmth at all. And they were found deceased lying around this fire. Seven other hikers were found in two different areas. One that appeared to go down to that tree where those two were, but then doubled back and tried to get up to the campsite, but didn't make it and fell to the ground and died there. The other group was not found for a couple of weeks later. They were found at the mouth of this river. They were inside of this, this den, and they were wearing the clothes of the other hikers that were deceased and the clothes they had on had traces of radiation on them. And the ones that were in the den had these devastating chest and skull injuries, and one of them was missing their eyeballs. And the official statement by the Soviet Union was they died from an unknown compelling force, which is a really mysterious way to describe how someone might die. This case was actually reinvestigated in 2020, and the new cause of death is death by avalanche, except loads of people disagree with that. In fact, experts have gone out to where this happened, and they say not only was there no avalanche, there's never been an avalanche in this area. There's literally never been one. So what do you think? Is there a connection between Hamar Daban and the Dyatlov Pass incident? Is there a cover-up in both cases where something far more sinister has happened to both groups that we don't know about? Or are they unrelated and these are just both examples of Mother Nature being far more powerful than we even realize? The next and final story of today's episode is a Mr. Ballin fan favorite. It's called Bell's Canyon. In 2016, a 25-year-old Wall Street banker named Matt was camping near Mount Rainier in Washington State. His job was so hectic that in the rare times he got a chance to, he would disappear into the wilderness for a few days to clear his head. Despite living in one of the biggest cities in the world, Matt was actually a very competent outdoorsman. And so for this trip, he decided he would stay way off any trail deep in the backcountry in random locations. On the first night, he found a nice clearing in the trees, and so he set up his campsite there. He ate some food over his fire, he pitched his tent, climbed inside, and within a few minutes, he was fast asleep. Several hours later, Matt woke up to some strange sounds coming from outside of his tent. It sounded like a couple of animals or maybe one animal moving around right outside. And so after a while of just hearing this constant sound, he rolled over and he barely unzipped his tent flap just to look out and see if he could see whatever animal it was. And what he saw shocked him. There was a man sitting in front of his fire pit. There was no fire in his fire pit. And the guy was just sitting there with his hands on his knees, looking straight down. And periodically, he would just kick his feet in the ashes of the fire pit. And Matt didn't even know what to do. So he's just looking at him through this little tiny gap in his tent. And this man all of a sudden looks up directly at Matt and makes eye contact with him. And the guy's eyes go wide and he stands up, turns around and runs away from Matt's campsite. Matt has no idea how to react to this, and so he just quickly unzips his tent, jumps outside, and shines his light into the forest looking for this guy. He's thinking to himself, who is this guy? I am in the middle of nowhere in the backcountry of Washington State. How long was he sitting outside there for? What does he want? And so as Matt is trying to make sense of this totally weird thing, he's thinking, okay, I'm going to look out and I'm going to see his flashlight somewhere, or I'm going to see his campsite. You know, maybe he's set up nearby and he's looking around into the total darkness. He's looking through all the trees, any light source, anywhere out there he would see. And there's not one. There's no fire. There's no flashlight. There is nothing. And so eventually Matt goes back inside of his tent. He zips it up and he's just left kind of dumbfounded. He can't understand how some person was just sitting outside of his tent for no apparent reason and then vanished into the forest without even turning on a flashlight. And so after a very restless night, finally the sun came up again and Matt was very relieved. He stepped outside and after a little bit of time now from this strange incident, Matt started to tell himself that all that was is some guy happened to set up his campsite nearby. It is possible, albeit rare because we're in the backcountry and maybe he was just intoxicated and he wandered over here and you know, stranger things have happened. So that's probably all it was. And so Matt felt like there was nothing to worry about. He packed up his campsite and he began hiking into the forest. Matt didn't have a planned route. Instead, he had a map and a compass and he began just kind of wandering in the forest, kind of exploring wherever he wanted to go. And over the next two days, he covered at least 10, maybe 15 miles in kind of random zigzag directions. He found a nice clearing and he set up another campsite. 
That night, he set up a fire and he was eating some food near his fire. And then as he's sitting there, he hears rustling coming from behind him. And he's pretty sure it's an animal. So he turns around and he doesn't see anything. And he goes back to eating his food. And then a little while later, he hears some more rustling behind him. And this time he can't really just write it off. Clearly there is something behind him that's moving around. And so he stood up, turned around and remained motionless and just listened, expecting to see maybe a deer come out of the woods. But instead he hears a man's voice come out of the darkness that says, do you know how to get to Bell's Canyon? And Matt's heart starts racing. He knows that even though he can't see him, it has to be the same guy he saw two days ago. Because they are in the middle of nowhere. He hasn't seen any other hikers or campers or anyone. And clearly this guy has the ability to sneak up on him. And so he's thinking, what does this guy want? I just spent the past two days hiking in random directions for 15 miles and he must have followed me. And so Matt, not knowing what else to do, just says, I don't know where Bell's Canyon is. And then there's silence. And Matt, one part of him is thinking, I hope this guy does not come into the light. I hope he just goes away. The other part of him is thinking, well, you know, maybe this is a different person that is lost and they're looking for this place called Bell's Canyon and they'll come into the light. It'll be a big relief. I'll send them on their merry way and everything will be fine. But as Matt is having this wishful thinking, the voice from the shadows does not come any closer, but instead asks the same question a bit more forcefully this time. Do you know how to get to Bell's Canyon? This time, Matt did not respond. Now he was scared. This is not some friendly hiker looking for directions. There's something wrong. And so Matt, knowing he's all alone out here, he knew he had to do something to try to take control of this situation. And so he took a deep breath, he reached down and grabbed his flashlight, and in one swift motion, he lifted his light up and shined it in the direction of this guy's voice. And what he saw was this guy from two days ago looking out from behind a tree right in Matt's direction. He was hiding from him. And when the light hit him, the man barked at Matt to aim it away. And Matt kind of instinctively lowered his light, but now he was too scared to raise it again, and now he knows it's the same guy. This guy has been following me for two days. And so for several minutes, Matt just stood there absolutely terrified, and this guy, he just stayed out there. Matt didn't hear him move. It was just a complete standstill. And then the silence was broken yet again by this voice, except somehow he had moved even closer to Matt. And when he came through asking the same question, Do you know how to get to Bell's Canyon? His voice was so close to Matt that Matt got scared and raised his light up, and the man was standing just a few feet away from him. And this time, the man's eyes got wide like they did the first time they saw Matt, and he turned around and he ran into the forest again. Matt, not knowing any better, just began running after him, but he only ran for about 30 seconds before he realized the terrain out here is so rough. He's gonna fall, get hurt, he's gonna get lost, and this guy's already long gone. He somehow managed to run immediately so far away, and so Matt just goes back to his campsite, and he's thinking to himself, what do I do? I have no cell phone service, I'm at least three days away from my car, and I'm in the middle of nowhere. No one even knows where I am because I didn't chart a course. I didn't tell anyone where I was gonna be. And so Matt just grabbed his knife and stood in the middle of the campsite, and for hours and hours, he just kept looking around, expecting this guy to just show up again or start speaking to him from somewhere out in the darkness. It was absolutely horrifying. Finally, by about three in the morning, Matt was so tired that he had to go to sleep. He hadn't heard this guy again, he didn't see him again, and he figured, I need a little bit of sleep because tomorrow he's gonna pack up his campsite and begin this epic journey back to his car. And so he climbed in his tent and he had a very restless next couple of hours. Then the sun came up, Matt jumped out of his tent, packed up his stuff, and began practically running in the direction of his car. All day as he was hiking, Matt kept looking over his shoulder, expecting to see this guy, because clearly he had followed him for multiple days over 15 miles, and so the likelihood that he's still following him was really high. And so all day, Matt just felt like he was being watched, he was totally terrified, and then the sun started to go down, and Matt knew he would have to camp out again. And so he found a clearing in the trees, he set up his campsite, and he was so tired from running basically all day and being so mentally exhausted from this experience that he just got in his tent and fell asleep very quickly. But several hours later, he woke up to the sound of somebody walking around his tent. And he knew it had to be this guy. He's still in the middle of nowhere. He's not even close to the parking lot yet. And so this guy is still following him. And so Matt sat up in his tent, he clutched his knife, and for hours and hours and hours, all night, this guy just walked around his campsite. And then around four or five in the morning, he scampered off. 
When the sun finally came up, Matt leapt out of his tent, packed up his stuff, and literally just began running in the direction of his car, hoping that maybe he could get there before needing to camp out one more night. And so all day as he moved, he's looking over his shoulder, knowing this guy is following him. At this point, it's not even a question. He's somewhere in the forest, but he could never see him. And unfortunately, as the sun was setting, he knew he was not going to be able to make it to his car. He was just too far away. And so at some point, when it got too dark to keep moving, he had to find a clearing and set up his tent again. And so once his tent was set up, he just climbed inside, grabbed his knife, and sat there, knowing this guy was somewhere out there. And so Matt climbed inside of his tent, he zipped it up behind him, he grabbed his knife, and he sat there, expecting to hear this guy come walking around. But after several hours, he didn't hear him. And Matt started to wonder, maybe this guy has left me alone, finally. Maybe he's not following me anymore. And so Matt, who was totally exhausted, laid down to go to sleep. And then, as he's laying there from somewhere out in the woods, Do you know how to get to Bell's Canyon? Matt immediately sat up, his heart began racing so fast that he actually was concerned he might have a heart attack. And he didn't know what to do, he didn't know what to say, so he just sat there holding his knife. And then this guy began running past his campsite making animal sounds, and he would stop periodically and moan and grunt, and he'd kick up leaves, and then he'd run past his campsite again, over and over and over again, until the sun finally came up and this guy scampered off back into the woods. Matt didn't waste any time, he leapt out of his tent, packed his stuff up, and ran all the way back to his car. When he finally got inside of his car, shut the door, and locked it, he cried tears of joy. He was so unbelievably relieved, and he peeled out of the parking lot, he got to a nearby hotel, he finally got cell phone reception, and he considered calling the police about this guy, but he thought, you know, what am I going to tell them? He didn't commit a crime, he was just terrifying. And so he decided not to call the police, he finally flew back to New York, and he just had to accept that there was some strange guy out in the wilderness of Washington State who was able to hunt him over three days and 30 miles in rugged terrain without the use of a flashlight, without any gear, and all he ever said to Matt was, Do you know how to get to Bell's Canyon? The state of Iowa is known as the corn capital of the world. But Iowa's 3 million residents do a lot more than produce billions of bushels of corn every year. They also personify some of the best qualities that America has to offer. Located in the Midwestern part of the country and surrounded by two rivers and six other states, the people of Iowa take pride in being friendly, considerate, law-abiding, hardworking, and just plain nice. The state is one of the safest in the country, and every year, national surveys show that Iowa residents are among the most polite Americans you will ever meet. And if there's one place in Iowa where you are guaranteed to be treated, quote, Iowa nice, it's the little town in the southwest corner of the state called Shenandoah. At one time, Shenandoah was considered the seed and nursery capital of the entire world. They no longer hold that title, but residents of this town are still surrounded by some of the most beautiful flowers and trees on the planet, along with some of the best-tasting fruits and vegetables. And back in 1988, if there was one person in Shenandoah who absolutely embodied the town's spirit of friendliness, hospitality, and local pride, it was 39-year-old Cindy Borton. If you were a visitor to Shenandoah back in the late 1980s, Cindy would be one of the first people to run right up to you to introduce herself and offer you directions or recommendations of where to go in her little town. And if you were one of Cindy's friends or neighbors, she would drop anything she was doing to help you, and it didn't matter if it was day or night. Unlike many of the town's 5,500 residents whose family had been living in the town for generations, Cindy and her husband Robert and their son John had moved to Shenandoah later in life. Cindy was born on May 22, 1949, in another small Iowa town called Garwin that was located three and a half hours to the northeast of Shenandoah. There, she and her brother had grown up playing outside and helping their parents with daily chores. After high school, Cindy went to work at a local restaurant, which is where she met her future husband, Robert. He had grown up in another Iowa town about 30 minutes away from her. Robert was a stocky young man with horn-rimmed glasses and brown hair that he swept back from his receding hairline, and when he met Cindy, he was instantly charmed by the smiling and laughing waitress with thick dark hair and shining eyes. A year after meeting, Cindy and Robert got married, and one year after that, they welcomed their first and only child, a baby boy named John. Early on in their marriage, 
Robert enlisted in the U.S. Navy, and so he was gone a lot of the time. As a result, Cindy stepped up and became the anchor of the family, always putting the needs of her husband and her son over her own. She also began working multiple part-time jobs to supplement Robert's military income, which was just not that much. However, she only took jobs that did not interfere with her ability to spend quality time with her son, John. In 1977, after Robert left the military, the Bortons moved to a town in Illinois called Evanston. There, Robert enrolled in a private seminary so that he could fulfill his lifelong dream of becoming an ordained pastor. In 1981, Robert graduated from the seminary, and a year later, he got an offer from a little church in Shenandoah asking him to come be their pastor. Robert and Cindy were thrilled, and so after Robert accepted the offer, the little family packed up their belongings and then made the eight-hour trip west back to their home state of Iowa and into the pretty little town of Shenandoah. Once in Shenandoah, Cindy immediately threw herself into her new role as the pastor's wife. She was naturally outgoing and empathetic, and so she pretty much instantly became a favorite, not just with Robert's congregation, but with the rest of the town as well. Even though Robert had landed his dream job, it was not a high-paying job, and so like Cindy, he needed to go out and pick up some extra work to make ends meet. Robert would get a part-time job at a car dealership where he washed and cleaned cars, and Cindy, after arriving in Shenandoah, worked as many as three part-time jobs, including her main one at a donut shop. But despite how much Cindy and Robert were forced to work every week, they were very happy people. In fact, when most people described Cindy when she was living in Shenandoah, they would talk about her laughter, because one, she seemed to always be laughing and smiling, and two, because her laughter was incredibly infectious, and anyone who heard it couldn't help but laugh themselves. But the Bortons' seemingly perfect life would go off the rails in 1987, five years after the Bortons had arrived in Shenandoah. That summer, Robert's church, which had been struggling financially for years, was finally forced to shut their doors, and so Robert's job was gone, and so too was his main source of income. This loss was devastating both emotionally and financially for the Borton family. By September of the following year, 1988, Robert had not had any luck finding another pastor gig in town or nearby, and the income they were making between Robert's car dealership work and Cindy's various part-time jobs was just not enough, and so the couple began talking about relocating. However, they both loved Shenandoah, it was their home, and John, who was 18 at the time, he was about to start his senior year in high school, and so they really didn't want to pull him out until he was done. And so Cindy and Robert decided that they would just stay in Shenandoah, and they would weather the financial storm they were in, and then maybe, after John graduated from high school, they would think about moving. But when John's senior year actually began that September, the Borton's 18-year-old son suddenly developed a serious case of senioritis, meaning he didn't want to go to school. And on the morning of Tuesday, September 6th, just a few days into the new school year, John walked into the family kitchen and announced to his mother that he did not want to go to school ever. Cindy had to argue with John all by herself because Robert had already left that morning for work. But luckily, John eventually just gave up because he knew his mother was not going to budge. She wanted him to go to school. And so, begrudgingly, John ate his breakfast, he gathered up his backpack, and he followed his mother out to her car that was parked in the driveway. On the drive to school, Cindy reminded her son that she'd be working at the donut shop that afternoon, and so he'd have to walk home. When they arrived at Shenandoah High School a few minutes later, John, who was still very annoyed with his mother for forcing him to go to school that day, he got out and he slammed the car door before mumbling a barely audible goodbye to his mother. As Cindy drove the short distance back to their house, she tried to tell herself that, you know, John's behavior was just typical teenage behavior, and once the school year really got going, John's attitude would surely improve. Still, it was something she intended to talk to Robert about when he came home that afternoon for his lunch break. Once Cindy was back at their home, she parked the car in the driveway and walked through the back door and down the short hallway into the kitchen. After cleaning up the breakfast dishes, she caught up on a few household chores and made sure that the clothes she planned to wear to work that afternoon were clean and ready to go. Then she glanced at her watch and headed back into the kitchen to heat up some spaghetti sauce and pasta for lunch with Robert. 
Right at 12 p.m. that afternoon, just a half mile away, Robert would tell his boss that he was headed home for his one hour long lunch break. A few minutes later, Robert pulled his pickup truck into the driveway of his modest little house, he turned off the engine, and he walked up the steps to the front door. As he stepped into their small living room, he called out to let Cindy know that he was home. After she called back to him from the kitchen, Robert went to the first floor bathroom to wash up before he too headed into the kitchen to join his wife. As Cindy served him a hot plate of spaghetti, Robert listened as Cindy told him about how John had not wanted to go to school that morning and how upset he was when she dropped him off. And Robert would agree with his wife that, you know, this did seem like typical teenage behavior and that, yeah, probably as the school year wore on, his attitude would change. The pair would chat about John's behavior for the bulk of their meal. And then at about 1245, Robert put his dishes in the sink. He thanked Cindy for his lunch. And then he told her he'd see her that afternoon after she got home from her shift at the donut shop. A few minutes after Robert had left the house to return to work, Cindy was already washing the lunch dishes when she heard a knock on the back door. She glanced at her watch and wondered who would be visiting her in the middle of the day. A little over an hour later, at around 2 p.m., Robert received a call at the car dealership where he worked. When his boss handed him the phone, Robert heard the voice of Cindy's co-worker at the donut shop. Sue Rogers told him that Cindy had not shown up for work which was unlike her since she usually arrived for her shift early. Sue had tried calling the Borton house, but no one had picked up. Robert told Sue that, you know, maybe Cindy had taken a nap after lunch and she's just overslept. An hour later, at 3 p.m., Robert got another call from the donut shop. This time, Sue sounded worried. Cindy still had not shown up for work, and a co-worker who went by the Borton house had stopped at the back door to call out for Cindy, but didn't get an answer and they noticed that the door was open. But this coworker didn't want to go inside without being invited, and so they left. Robert called home, and when Cindy did not pick up the phone, he asked his boss if he could leave work to go check on his wife. Just after 3.30 p.m., Robert pulled up to his house, and the first thing he noticed was that Cindy's car was still in the driveway. After parking his truck just behind her car, Robert walked up to the front door and let himself in, calling out his wife's name as soon as he stepped inside. When there was no answer, Robert began walking from the living room where he came in at the front of the house toward the back of the house where the kitchen was. As he walked, he kept yelling out for Cindy, but it was silent. When Robert finally reached the kitchen and got a view of the kitchen, he came to a complete and sudden stop. Backing slowly away, Robert reached for a nearby phone on the wall, and he called 911. When they picked up, he would tell police to come to his house right away because his wife had had a terrible accident. After hanging up the phone, Robert grabbed the family dog's collar off of a nearby hook, and he put it on the dog and led the dog outside to the backyard where he tied the dog up, and then Robert walked around the outside of the house to the driveway in front, where he leaned against the side of Cindy's car, and there he waited patiently for the police to arrive. When the local police and ambulance arrived at the Borton house a few minutes later, Robert stepped forward to meet them. Then he stayed outside while the police and the medical technicians entered the front door and made their way into the kitchen and back. What they saw inside was so shocking and so gruesome that the chief of police, Richard Hunt, he knew this was not a crime or a crime scene that his local police force could handle. He needed serious help from the state, and he needed that help right away. The kitchen was covered in blood and lying on her back in the middle of the floor was Cindy Borton. She had been stabbed 29 times with various bloody weapons that were found near her body on the ground. Based on the sheer violence of the attack and the fact that the back door had been unlocked and undamaged, Chief Hunt was sure that this crime had been personal. He knew the crime statistics in Iowa. 85% of all homicides in the state were committed by people and family members who were close to the victim which meant that right away, Cindy's husband, Robert, and her son, John, were at the top of the list of potential suspects. And so as Chief Hunt and the rest of the local police force more or less waited for the state law enforcement to arrive so they could actually begin processing the scene, Chief Hunt decided to just go outside and speak with Robert. And so he went outside, he walked down the front steps, and he made his way over to Robert, who was still near Cindy's car, and Chief Hunt would ask him, Robert, do you have any idea who could have done this to your wife? 
After Robert said, no, he didn't, the police chief was shocked when Cindy's husband went on to insist that his wife's death must have been an accident. But before the chief could continue questioning Robert, they were interrupted by the arrival of the Borton family's son, John, who was walking down the road towards the family house on his way home from school. John slowed down as he approached the house and took in the sight of the police cars and an ambulance parked along the curb and the yellow crime scene tape along the perimeter of their yard. When John reached his father, Robert told him that something bad had happened to his mother and that she was dead. But as Robert reached out to put his hands on his son's shoulders, John dropped his backpack and just turned around and started running. Later, he would tell law enforcement that the news was so shocking he just couldn't handle it, and so that's why he ran. When John did return to his house almost two hours later, personnel from the state's Division of Criminal Investigation had finally arrived, and they were dusting for fingerprints and gathering evidence inside of the Borden house. And local law enforcement had fanned out around the neighborhood to ask the Borton's neighbors if they had seen anything unusual or suspicious that day. By then, Robert had also told police exactly what he had done that day, starting with him leaving the house at 6.45 a.m. to go to work, and then arriving at work at 7 a.m., and then coming home again at noon for lunch with Cindy, and then leaving again and getting back to the car dealership at 1 p.m. Robert also described the calls he got from the donut shop saying that Cindy had not shown up for her 2 p.m. shift, and he would describe to police what it was like when he arrived at his house at 3.30 p.m. to check to see if Cindy was okay. After John was back at the house, he would tell police that he had been at school from the time his mother had dropped him off in the morning until school let out at 3.30 and then he had walked home. When the state investigators asked John if anything about that morning had seemed out of the ordinary, at first, John said no, but then after a few seconds, he changed his answer to yes. He said that he and his mother had been arguing that morning because John didn't want to go to school that day, but he told police this was not anything serious. By the time John and Robert left the Borton property to go stay that night with friends that they knew from Robert's old church, word had spread throughout Shenandoah that something unspeakable had happened to one of the town's most popular residents. Early the next morning on September 7th, there were police officers waiting at Robert's car dealership to check on Robert's alibi. And while Robert's timesheet confirmed the timeline Robert had given them, Robert's boss added one detail about that day that Robert had left out. When Robert arrived back at the dealership after his lunch break, he had apparently changed his clothes. When asked if that was unusual, his boss would say, not really. Robert's boss would say that on Tuesdays, the car dealership's commercial cleaning service would come by to pick up dirty uniforms and rags. And so Robert's boss thought that, you know, maybe Robert had come to work that day in his work clothes. He had gotten a full morning of work in. And then when he went home for lunch, he had changed. And then when he had come back, maybe he had dropped off those dirty clothes from the morning with the cleaning service. While this seemed totally plausible, investigators couldn't help but think that if Robert was involved in the murder of his wife, and if there was any evidence from the murder on those work clothes, well, that evidence was now being destroyed by a commercial washing machine. Meanwhile, investigators who had arrived at Shenandoah High School early that morning to check John's alibi also had some questions. It would turn out John's alibi was not as straightforward as he had made it seem. His teachers at his high school told police that yes, John had come to school the previous day, but he did not have any classes between 1 and 3 p.m., and no one could really verify his whereabouts at that time, and it just so happens that that was likely the time frame when his mother was killed. And later that afternoon, a neighbor would tell police that they had seen a teenager running through the Borton's backyard around the time that Cindy would have been killed. The neighbor couldn't give police much of a description of this teenager, except to say that the teenager was a boy, and that he had a thin build, and it looked like his hair was brown, which was basically a perfect description of John. And so, two days after Cindy's death, detectives brought John into the police station for questioning. 
When pressed about the 1 to 3 p.m. gap in his alibi, John would adamantly state that he never left school grounds during that time period. He said he had been at school all day from the time his mother dropped him off until he walked home and discovered the police and ambulances in front of his house. When asked about his parents' relationship, John admitted that there was some tension there and that sometimes he heard his parents arguing mostly about money. But John also told police that his mother and father were very committed to each other and had been quite happy in the past. And so no matter what problems they might be having, John was confident that his parents were not even close to getting divorced. He believed they would look to find a solution that kept them together. As for his own relationship with his mother, John told police that his mother had been everything to him and that it totally crushed him that his last interaction with her was that stupid fight about him not wanting to go to school. Despite Robert and John continuing to deny that they had anything to do with the murder, 48 hours into the investigation, the father and son were still the prime suspects. Three days after Cindy's murder, on September 9th, the results of her autopsy came back. Based on the fact that the spaghetti she had eaten for lunch on the day of her murder was completely undigested, police were able to narrow the time of her death down to about 1 p.m. Meanwhile, investigators questioning teachers and students at Shenandoah High School were starting to believe that John had been telling the truth, that he really had been on school grounds on the day of the murder from 1 to 3 p.m. At Cindy's memorial service on September 13th, six days after her murder, investigators were waiting outside the church. Before scratching John off of their suspect list, they wanted to talk with John's best friend, Jim Bettis, to see if he could offer any additional insights into John's relationship with his mother. Jim had been a frequent visitor at the Borton household, and since Cindy's death, he had been spending a lot of time with John, comforting him. And so police were hopeful that if John was involved, you know, maybe Jim would have picked up on it, and maybe Jim would be willing to talk about it. But according to Jim, there really were no problems between John and his mother. He said John loved his mother and that he would never hurt her. And as for that fight that they got in over John going to school or not that morning, Jim said that was totally insignificant and not a reflection of John and Cindy's actual relationship. After speaking with Jim and a few other friends of John's that came out of the memorial service, investigators felt satisfied that John really was not involved, and so they crossed his name off the suspect list. So with no other new leads and no further information on any teenager running across the Borton's yard on the afternoon of the murder, investigators were now sure that the killer had to be Cindy's husband, Robert. So about one week after the murder, investigators brought Robert into the interrogation room in the basement of the local police station. And then once he was sitting down, a special agent from the state's division of criminal investigation leaned in close to Robert and said, Bob, let's quit playing games. We both know Cindy was dead when you went back to work. But for the next three hours, Robert, who showed very little emotion and no signs of grief, refused to change his story. He said he had nothing to do with his wife's murder. He said that Cindy had seemed totally normal when he left for work early on the morning of the day she died, and when he came home for lunch that day at noon, she was alive. And she was also still alive when he left to go back to work at 12.45 p.m. Before leaving the police station, Robert agreed to have his fingerprints collected, and he agreed to take a lie detector test. So, the very next day, a special agent drove Robert 150 miles northeast to Des Moines, where Robert was hooked up to a polygraph machine that would measure his physical reactions to a series of key questions. Questions like, did you hurt your wife? Or, did you kill your wife? And Robert would answer these questions the same way he had the day before in the basement interrogation room at the police station. No, I didn't hurt my wife. No, I didn't kill my wife. But this time, the polygraph machine showed that Robert was not being truthful. He didn't fail his test by much, but the results convinced investigators that despite Robert's denials, he must be the killer. And so the agent who had administered the lie detector test pulled Robert aside for another round of intense questioning, telling him, hey, you failed this test, so you gotta tell us the truth now. But Robert continued to say that he had nothing to do with it and he even fell asleep during this interrogation. Even with this failed lie detector test, 
The police lacked hard evidence that linked Robert to the murder. And so even though they wanted to keep him, they couldn't. They had to let him go. And so a special agent drove Robert back to Shenandoah, and on the drive, he turned to Robert and he said, You know, Bob, when this is all over and you've been arrested, charged, tried, and convicted, I would be honored if you confessed to me. But a week later, two and a half weeks after Cindy's murder, investigators got another piece of bad news when the state's crime lab reported that they had not been able to lift any fingerprints from the various murder weapons that had been found in Cindy's kitchen. They also were unable to pull any prints off of any other physical evidence that had been sent off for testing. As September inched towards October, and police had still not made any arrests, the residents of Shenandoah were outraged and scared. Every day, they called the police station and the mayor's office seeking updates, and local gun stores reported a serious uptick in sales. And in November, Robert, who was being questioned by police nearly every day, and was being shunned by residents who now walked across the street to avoid talking with him, he packed up the family's belongings and moved with John to the town of Gladbrook, just outside of Des Moines, where he and Cindy had actually gotten married. Around this time, local reporters began asking the question that was on everyone's mind. How was it possible that in a town as small as Shenandoah, police could not figure out who had committed such a heinous crime? And on top of having a murderer on the loose, Shenandoah also had an arsonist on the loose. Around the time Cindy was killed, someone had been intentionally setting fires around town, damaging an elementary school, as well as destroying a pickup truck. And while the arson attacks didn't appear to be connected to Cindy's murder, it did seem odd that there would be two violent crimes happening at the same time in a town that saw almost zero violent crime. And so some investigators began to suspect, just because of the rarity of violent crime, that the arson attacks and the murder had to be connected. And on November 30th of that year, their suspicions seemed to be confirmed. On that day, there was an arson attack at Shenandoah City Hall, except this time, the arsonist left behind a note. On this note, the arsonist warned police that the school fire and the truck fire and the murder of Cindy Borton were nothing compared to what was coming next. At the end of this note, the arsonist identified themselves as, quote, the Night Stalker. The Night Stalker was the name of a notorious murderer in California who had been captured three years earlier. But what really caught the attention of law enforcement was the fact that whoever had signed the note also left behind a fingerprint at the very bottom of the piece of paper the note was written on. While investigators waited on the results of the fingerprint analysis, they returned to the scenes of the earlier arson attacks and on a bridge near the school fire, police had found the letters NS painted on a concrete support. They believed these had to be the initials of the Night Stalker. By early December, the mayor of Shenandoah had received more than 200 calls from terrified residents demanding that the police find the arsonist slash killer before they murdered anyone else. But the Night Stalker lead came to an abrupt end a few weeks later when the fingerprint analysis not only failed to match Richard Borton's fingerprints, it didn't match any prints on file in any local, state, or federal law enforcement database. So unfortunately, both the arson cases and the murder case began to grow cold. It wasn't until five months after Cindy Borton's murder that local and state investigators would get the tip they needed to break the murder and arson cases wide open. Around dinner time on the cloudy, cool night of January 30th, 1989, the Shenandoah police chief, Richard Hunt, got a call from one of his officers. There was a teenager who had just walked into the police station and he wanted to talk with someone about the murder of Cindy Borton. A few minutes later, Chief Hunt was sitting in his office looking across his desk at 18-year-old Jack Johnson, one of John Borton's best friends and classmates, and one of the boys investigators had talked with back in September when they were confirming John's alibi for the time of his mother's murder. Jack told Chief Hunt that a few days earlier, on January 26th, Jack had been talking to someone, and during their conversation, Jack had asked this person what was the worst thing they had ever done. And this person paused for a moment, and then they said to Jack, 
I've done something that I'm pretty sure God will never forgive me for. Jack would go on to tell police all the awful details of what this person claimed to have done that God would not forgive them for. Based on Jack's testimony, this is a reconstruction of what really happened to Cindy Borden. Back on the day that Cindy died, September 6, 1988, she and her husband Robert were sitting in the kitchen eating spaghetti and talking about their son's recent bad behavior. After Robert was done eating, he put his dirty dishes in the sink, he thanked his wife for the food, and then he headed out the door to go back to work. As Cindy began washing the dishes, she heard a knock on the back door. Glancing at her watch, she saw it was already almost 1 p.m., which meant she didn't really have a lot of time to visit with whoever this was before she had to step away and get ready for her 2 p.m. shift at the donut shop. And so feeling a little bit flustered, Cindy turned off the faucet and she dried her hands. And then she walked around the counter and she walked down the very short hallway that led to the back door of the house. And as she walked down this hallway, she looked through the glass of the back door and she saw who her visitor was. And even though she was pressed for time, she couldn't help herself. She smiled. She was happy to see him. However, she was a little bit concerned that her visitor was not in school. But she opened the door, and as soon as the door was open, her visitor immediately reassured her that he understood he was supposed to be in school and he'd be there soon. He was just stopping by because he was hoping that Cindy wouldn't mind being a reference for a job that he was going to be applying for. And so Cindy said, yeah, of course I'll be a reference for your new job. I'd love to hear about your new job. Come inside. Let's talk about it. And so her visitor stepped inside, and as they walked down the little hallway towards the kitchen, the visitor asked Cindy if it was okay if she got him a glass of water because he was really thirsty. And so Cindy said, yeah, no problem. Come in the kitchen. I'll get you water, and we can talk about this new job. And so they start walking down this hallway, and the visitor reaches into his pocket, and he unfolds his pocket knife. And right as Cindy is stepping into the kitchen with her back to him, he walks up behind her, he reaches around the front of her neck, and he digs the blade into the front of her throat, cutting her neck wide open. Cindy instinctively reached up and tried to grab her neck to protect herself, but her attacker grabbed her hands, pulled them away, and then with the knife, he dug another trench across her throat. And then the attacker backed up a couple of steps. Cindy, who was now pouring blood out of her neck, stumbled forward into the kitchen, and then she whipped around, clutching her throat, looking at her attacker. It was 18-year-old Jim Bettis, her son's best friend. But she didn't have time to process who was attacking her, because before long, as she was staring at him, he lunged at her again, slashing and cutting her. And so she put her hands up over her face to protect herself, and he was digging the knife over and over again into her forearms and her hands and all over her body. And eventually she kind of slumped onto the kitchen counter after being stabbed and cut so many times, at which point Jim walked away from her and he walked over to a drawer that he knew from all of the visits he had made to this household to visit with John. He knew that in this drawer were kitchen knives and other utensils. And so as Cindy is laying right near him up against the counter pleading with him to stop and she's bleeding everywhere, he reaches into this drawer and he pulls out two of Cindy's sharpest knives and he sets them on the counter and then he pulls out two long serving forks that each had very pointed prongs at the end. And so he turns around to look at Cindy and Cindy sees what he's doing and so she tries to make a run for the phone to call 911. But before she could get there, Jim grabbed the two knives that he had just taken out of the drawer and he leapt in front of Cindy and began stabbing her over and over and over again on her sides, her front, her face, her hands, her legs, anywhere he could, he would stab her. And Cindy the whole time is trying to hit him and push him back, but there's nothing she can do. She's helpless. And then at some point she kind of falls to the ground, but she's not dead yet. And so at that point, Jim put down the two knives he had just taken out of that drawer, and he went back and he got the two serving forks. And then he went back over to Cindy, who was now crawling across the ground, trying to get to the phone, and he began stabbing her in the back, in the back of the neck, on the side, over and over and over again. Despite multiple puncture wounds to her vital organs, Cindy was not dying. She was bleeding profusely, she was likely mortally wounded at this point, but she kept trying to move forward. She kept trying to fight back. She was doing anything she could to save herself. But eventually, Jim overpowered her. He flipped her over onto her back. 
and then kneeling next to her, he got his tools lined up next to him, the two knives, his own knife, and the two serving forks, and systematically he began using these tools to begin cutting and slashing and digging into the front of her torso. And he would continue to do that until Cindy finally stopped moving. And when she did stop moving, he picked up one of the serving forks, he raised it up over his head, and then he brought it straight down into her neck, plunging it deep inside of her. And then he let go of the handle, leaving the fork stuck into her neck. Then he wiped off the handle of that fork, as well as the other handles of the other murder weapons, which he just left on the floor next to Cindy, with the exception of his folding knife, he would take that. Then Jim stood up and walked into the small bathroom near the kitchen, and he washed his hands and face, leaving faint traces of blood in the sink, but wiping his fingerprints from the faucet handles. Then Jim retraced his steps to the back door. He stepped outside, and he paused for just a minute before taking off at a run across the Borton's yard. He would be seen by that neighbor, except the neighbor would only be able to describe him as a thin teenager with brown hair. Three hours later, Jim and his parents would be out driving around when they passed John, who had just bolted from the scene and the news of his mother's death. Jim's parents slowed the car down, and Jim leaned out the window, and he comforted his friend, asking him if he wanted to come into the car and talk about what happened, you know, did he need a ride anywhere? But John, who was in a state of shock, would just shake his head and keep on running. Five months after killing his best friend's mother, Jim would confess his crime to his other best friend, Jack Johnson. Not only would Jim tell Jack exactly where he had disposed of his pocket knife, he would also draw a diagram for Jack showing him exactly where Jim had left Cindy's body inside the Borton's kitchen. On the night of January 30th, which was the day that Jack Johnson had gone to police to tell them about Jim, he presented Jim's hand-drawn diagram and pushed it across the desk to Chief Hunt. On February 2nd, 1989, police asked Jim Bettis to come to the police station for an interview. Once inside the interrogation room, Jim denied everything, saying he had never had that conversation with Jack Johnson. But after agreeing to let police collect his fingerprints, police determined Jim's prints matched the one found on the note left by the Night Stalker. After another round of questioning, Jim eventually admitted to being the arsonist, but it wasn't until he conclusively and massively failed his polygraph test that he would admit to police that, yes, he had killed Cindy Borden. It would turn out Jim had nothing against Cindy. The person he really hated was his own father. According to Jim, his father had spent years deriding and criticizing him. For a while, Jim had taken out his anger by setting fires around town, but for the last several months, he'd come to despise his father so much that all Jim could think about was killing him. But Jim was afraid of his father and couldn't really imagine himself besting his father in any kind of physical confrontation. And Jim wasn't even sure he could go through with killing anyone. So he decided what he needed to do was practice. He needed to find someone who would be easy to kill, someone vulnerable, someone who trusted him, someone who loved him. And the one person who fit that bill was his best friend's mother, Cindy Borton. As far back as Jim could remember, Cindy had been the one person he knew who was always glad to see him and who always had time to talk with him and who always offered him encouragement. She would be the last person to suspect that he could ever hurt her. And so he told himself if he could kill Cindy, maybe he could also kill his father. The police were able to finally prove their case against Jim when they found his pocket knife that he had tossed under a local bridge. The knife still had Cindy's blood on it, along with Jim's fingerprints. On November 13th, 1989, Jim Bettis, who was 19 years old at the time, was convicted of first-degree murder and sentenced to life in prison without parole. In a letter Jim wrote from prison, he told a relative that when he, quote, killed that lady, I guess I went too far and pretended that she was my dad. By 1990, two years after Cindy's murder, Robert and John had moved again, this time to Eldora, Iowa, a town of 3,000 residents located about three and a half hours northeast of Shenandoah. Robert would remarry, and he would find work at a plastics recycling plant. State and local law enforcement in Shenandoah defended the intensive investigation techniques they used with Robert, saying that from the start, he was their only viable suspect. 
Now 52 years old, Cindy's son John wants people to remember his mother for her life, not her death. He would tell reporters in April of 2022 that she was a wonderful, wonderful person and I only miss her on days that end in the letter Y. Thank you for taking the time to watch the video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please like, comment, and subscribe to the channel for more content. Your support means a lot to us and helps us create more videos that you'll love. We appreciate your feedback and would love to hear your thoughts on the video. What did you like about it? What could we improve? Your feedback will help us create better content in the future. If you're interested in seeing more videos like this, please subscribe to our channel. We post new videos every week, so you'll always have something new to watch. Once again, thank you for watching and supporting our channel. We hope to see you again soon. Smiling face.